hesitate to reach out to our office. Um, again, that is by far the most important bit of information I will give today. And uh, we'll just dig right in. Um, the laws that we administer through our Bureau are the Employment Relationship, Independent Contractor Status, Wage and Wage Protection, Minimum Wage and Overtime, Work Comp Compliance, Child Labor, and Prevailing Wage. We'll start with the employment relationship as this is uh, an area of often of confusion. Um, how an individual receives their payment is not in and of itself definitive of the relationship. So whether or not an individual receives a W-2 or a 1099 does not in and of itself for the Department of Labor's perspective indicate whether or not an individual is truly an employee or an independent contractor. So who's an independent contractor? The, the statute that addresses this is in, in the workers, um, workers' comp statutes. So that's important to note because it addresses the independent contractor exemption certificate. And often there's some confusion with that certificate. So the reason that a statute in work comp addresses that certificate is that certificate is literally an individual waiving their rights to work comp. As you guys can see on the screen here, basically it says that uh, somebody working outside of their fixed business location either will obtain an ICEC or the independent contractor exemption certificate or cover themselves individually by a work comp plan one, two, or three. So those plans real quick are a uh, self-insured, that's plan one, that's going to be incredibly large employers private insurer. So that might be somebody who you may go to to get general commercial liability. They very well may offer um, work comp insurance or plan three is a guaranteed insurer or in our state, it's Montana State Fund. Uh, so they will issue a policy. They very, may or may not be the cheapest option, but they, they are a guaranteed insurer. So one thing that's important to note here is that, again, the independent exemption certificate is in no way the state indicating that an individual can do the occupation or profession they're indicating. It is simply that an individual has applied to the department, provided a modicum of documentation showing they're in business for themselves and that they're waiving their rights to work comp and generally speaking, unemployment insurance, obviously, if they're not contributing um, or and uh, taking on their own tax liability. So who's required to have it and who's not? Generally speaking, folks working outside of a fixed business location in their own business are required to have it. Uh, there are some exemptions for corporate officers. They have to be listed as corporate officers um, through the Secretary of State's office for that particular corporation, and they have to own 20% or more of that corporation. Um, similarly, managers of manager-managed LLCs outside of the construction industry can do that. And then there's other specific criteria and exemptions. For instance, one of my favorites, and I don't honestly know why it's my favorite, I just think it's kind of quirky, is that I believe that uh, to this date, jockeys are um, exempt from needing work comp. So if anybody is a professional jockey, you may indeed be exempt. So the idea of a fixed business location, this throws folks off sometimes. So we'll discuss that really quick. Um, so if there's an individual, let's say that they make cabinets and they have a pole barn outside of their residence where they make those cabinets. If they never leave their property, they never leave their fixed business location. They simply manufacture these, uh, these cabinets in their, in their pole barn. And then when folks want them, they come and pick them up. They wouldn't necessarily need either an independent exemption or a work comp policy. In the event that they struck up a deal with a home builder, to go out on onto a job site and install those cabinets, now they would need that. Um, they would either need an independent exemption or they would need to cover themselves under work comp. Um, the default position in the state of Montana is that of an employee. If an individual either covers themselves or obtains an independent exemption certificate, then their default position shifts to that of an independent contractor, unless for instance, a review of the relationship needs to be done. And we'll jump in there. 
So if a review of the relationship is done, the, the first step is what's referred to as uh, the A-B test. And that is they must be free from control and direction and must have their own independently established trade, business, occupation, or profession listed on their ICEC. Both of those might be met. It's not an either or situation. And probably the most important a uh, bit of, of information on the screen there is listed on their ICEC. If an individual is working outside of the capacity listed on their ICEC, they are by default an employee. Uh, so for instance, there was a, uh, a business owner I spoke with in the Bitterroot a couple years ago, and they had hired a gentleman. It was a, a, actually sort of a textbook situation. They did everything right on the front end. They they uh, wanted a deck built on the back of their business. So they, they uh, went out to several independent contractors. They got bids. They picked the one they wanted. They made sure that guy had an independent exemption certificate. They double-checked uh, general commercial liability. They double-checked references. They got him the deposit down. He bought the materials. He built the deck. As they were settling up, they mentioned that they had some trees in the back of their lot that they wanted to get dropped. And they were just curious if he knew anybody in the area. Uh, and he said that actually he had performed similar work prior to becoming an independent contractor for a landscaping company. And he said, you know, I'd be happy to come in here and uh, I could knock these out in a day and gave them a, uh, a price. And they agreed, handshake deal. Uh, he dropped the trees. They paid him. Everything was good. The downside is that his independent exemption certificate didn't list anything except for um, Carpenter. So any work he did besides that, he was default their employee. Now, luckily in this situation, when I talked to him, it was uh, years after this had happened. They were just completely unaware of the potential liability they exposed themselves to. When you're dealing with independent contractor exemption certificate issues, there's potential penalties up to $1,000 per occurrence on both sides. And obviously in this case, the employer took on the liability of not only the tax liability, the unemployment liability, and potentially the work comp liability. Again, thankfully, nothing happened in that instance. But if you are looking to be an independent contractor, it's imperative that you determine what the scope of your work is going to be and list that on there. There can be a multitude of occupations listed on a single uh, exemption certif certificate. Just documentation has to be provided for that. Now the fee for an ICEC is $125 and that doesn't go up the more occupations an individual has. So if, uh, if somebody is sort of a jack of all trades, they might need to list several things. Likewise, if somebody's a hiring agent, it's imperative they verify what's listed on their ICEC. So they're not uh, by default bringing on somebody as an employee they're not wishing to. So next we get into the factors of control. What we're looking at here is the direct evidence of control or direction of the right to control the worker, furnishing of substantial equipment, method of payment, the right to fire without liability. So when these are getting reviewed, you can think of it, whether it's a uh, investigator um, or, uh, or an auditor or an inspector, each bit of evidence is either gonna be viewed as indicative of a independent contractor or indicative of an employee. And it's sort of like a balance or a scale. And each bit of evidence is going on to one side or the other. And once they go through the totality of evidence, whichever is greater, that's the determination. So direct evidence of control or direction or the right to control the worker, uh, telling somebody when, what, where, how to do the work. If, if a hiring agent tells a uh, alleged um, independent contractor that they need to show up at eight, they're going to take a break at 10. They're going to take lunch from 12 to noon and they leave the job site at five. And here's how you're going to perform this work. That's employee like, that's not independent contractor like. Um, furnishing substantial equipment or materials. So the materials are a big part of this one that get a lot of folks into trouble. If if the, let's use that, that first analogy that uh, hiring agent is telling that person when to show up, what to do. Well, now if they also supply the materials to do that job, I mean, clearly an independent contractor should have their own tools to do the occupation or profession that they're indicating that the business that they're in, if they can't furnish their own equipment, one would question the validity of, uh, of them being in business for themselves. Um, likewise, 
generally speaking, materials are going to be addressed in the bid process. So they should have the choice of what materials or where they're going to procure their materials. So generally speaking, it's not an uncommon practice for the bid to say, I'm going to get X percentage up front or X dollars up front, so I may get materials. Uh, and then the rest is due upon completion of the project. Not a method of payment. Both the Supreme Court and the Montana Work Comp Court have uh, issued findings that payment on an hourly basis is indicative of, though not definitive of, an employee-employer relationship, where payment on a project basis is indicative of an independent contractor hiring agent. And uh, piece rate can be either, et cetera. Um, so again, it's not a, if this happens, if they're paid by the hour, they're definitively an employee, but it is, uh, it, it's certainly a strong indication of that. Um, generally speaking, an independent contractor, whether that project takes them five hours or five days, they've bid it and it's up to them to adjust accordingly. And then the right to fire without liability. So, um, Outside of the Wrongful Discharge from Employment Act, an employer doesn't have liability uh, if they terminate an employee. So outside of wrongful termination, there's not, there's not liability. There's not contractual liability. In a true independent contractor hiring agent relationship, generally speaking, that, uh, that contract they enter into or the acceptance of that bid, it's, it's going to set specific deliverables. And there's going to be... Um, measurable dates on there that if certain uh, thresholds and certain deliverables aren't found by certain dates, then both sides are uh, going to have liability. And then if the, uh, if the relationship is separated prior to the completion of said project, there's generally speaking liability. So this is what an ICEC looks like currently. Um, the image on the bottom is a card that the independent contractor can pop out. So it's, it's perforated and uh, it shows um, on the top there that, you know, an ICEC number. Um, this gets referred to as a license at, at times. Uh, definitively, again, this is not a license. There is no test. There is a, a modicum of evidence that needs to be provided to the state to indicate they're in business from themselves, but the state isn't indicating that they know how to do the job that they're doing. Um, it certainly would, would behoove hiring agents to get references. Um, the same isn't true for licensed trades, right? So if you get into plumbers, electricians, et cetera, there's clear delineations and steps they need to go through to re, uh, obtain those licenses. And then on the right, it does show the, you know, the, the potential penalties. And again, you're looking at a thousand dollar penalty per occurrence. So it behooves people A, to be in compliance if they're choosing to go into business for themselves. And then B, for a hiring agent to respect that independent contractor relationship and not overstep the bounds and treat them as an employee because both parties are potentially liable. Now, most often the independent exemption certificate is a, is a great platform for, um, for folks just entering the marketplace with their entrepreneurial venture to start out. I, I spoke with a gentleman the other day. Uh, he happens to be a drywaller. Um, we discussed matters and he's actually transitioning from his ICEC to work comp. Um, he had his third child. His wife's now staying home, taking care of the, the children. And part of the discussion we had um, was on what happens in the event that he's injured. And for instance, work comp is there to pay 66 and two thirds, I believe it is, of your average weekly wage. So in the event that he gets injured or an occupational disease and truthfully in the, in the construction industry, uh, it's likely that one of those is going to happen. It's, it's, it's much more likely that it's a, a win, not an if sort of a situation. Um, and he just determined that, that right now he's got, he's got too much on the line. If he, if he injures himself, he needs to have an income coming in to take care of his family. So next, let's move on to, uh, to minimum wage. So currently in the state of Montana, minimum wage is $8.65 an hour. Uh, as of January 1, it will go up to $8.75 an hour. Federally, it's seven twenty-five an hour. The reason I mention that it's a it's an important um, uh, conceptual understanding to to understand the higher uh, 
the higher standard principle. So for instance, even though the federal minimum wage is 725 in the state of Montana, we have the higher standard. So the vast majority of time that is going to be required. Um, if anyone ever thinks that the minimum wage does not apply to them or their business, because there are some very unique exceptions, I strongly encourage them to reach out to our office and discuss their specific situation be, before, um, before proceeding down that route or just be make sure that you know all the ducks are in the row, that, that you really are reading things and understanding things uh, correctly. State of Montana doesn't allow meal credit uh, training wage or tip credit. Now we'll start at the bottom there. Tips are the property of the tipped employee. The tips uh, and individuals can enter into voluntarily in, into a tip pooling agreement and that will, those tips will be gathered and dispersed according to that agreement. That cannot be mandated by the employer. Every employee has the ability to either choose to participate or not. Other states, what they're allowed to do is they're allowed to offset minimum wage by tips received. So uh, for instance, there are uh, states through the Midwest where it's not uncommon for people in the service industry, waiters, waitresses, bartenders, et cetera, to make $2.25 an hour, for instance. That's their actual hourly wage as long as they receive the offset uh, by a tips to make up the difference between that and minimum wage. Training wage, this gets conflated a bit because as long as minimum wage is being met, an individual can start at a wage, let's just theoretically say $10 an hour, and the employer can establish it on the front and that, hey, we're going to go through, we have a 180 day probationary period upon that probationary period, we're going to review things. If we choose that you're a good fit for our company, we're going to bring you on and we're going to raise that uh, by a dollar an hour. All wages involved there meet the minimum wage. That's not what they're talking about. There are potential in certain states where in the past they have utilized a training wage that is sub minimum wage for a, for a period of time that is not permissible in the state of Montana. Likewise, meal credits. You can't offset somebody's wage by meal credits. Here's a jurisdictional flow chart. And this is really to understand who is covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. The short of this, and it will tie in with the idea of higher standard principle, the short of this is that the vast majorities of employees are covered in the state of Montana. So um, there's enterprise coverage, which has to do with uh, state, municipality, hospitals, education, et cetera, uh, or those make, um, businesses grossing 500,000 or greater in sales. Then there's individual coverage and this often boils down to interstate commerce. Interstate commerce can be something as simple as sending or receiving emails that is between parties across state lines. Likewise with mail, same with shipping and receiving of goods, same with processing of credit card payments, same with taking out of state checks. There's not a credit card processing facility in the state of Montana I'm aware of. So anybody running a credit card for payment is engaging in interstate commerce. Likewise, if, if goods are manufactured or records are retained addressing interstate commerce or goods are manufactured that are then shipped out of state, that's all interstate commerce. Everybody there is covered under the Fair Labor Standards Act. That gets to be important uh, once we get into some of the exemptions. So over time, is based on hours actually worked over 40 in a work week uh, for non-exempt employees. And that non-exempt is the key component there. Holiday, sick, vacation, PTO, these aren't hours actually worked. So if an individual is granted eight hours of pay, let's say a holiday uh, falls on a Monday and their employer is gracious enough to allow them eight hours of holiday pay. And then they work four 10 hour shifts for the remainder of the work week. They're not due eight hours overtime. They're due eight hours of holiday pay and 40 hours of, uh, of, of regular pay. Establishing a work weeks. Um, it's addressed in statute and rule that a work week is a seven day repeating period that if the uh, employer does not specify, it goes from Sunday to Saturday. Work weeks and pay periods are not the same. They can be the same, but they're often different. So a work week is always a seven day period. 
a pay period may be weekly, it may be biweekly, it may be semi-monthly, it may be monthly. That's an important distinction. So for instance, the red circles there on the first and the 15th, what that's indicating is that this is a semi-monthly pay period. With a semi-monthly pay period is certainly permissible and legal. However, it is by far the most complicated and wrought with potential errors of the of the uh, pay periods established. Because you can see if there's if there's the seven day repeating period from Sunday to Saturday, there are always partial work weeks in these different pay periods. That adds a lot of confusion. Um, I had an employer reach out a couple of years ago now, and and she wanted to go from a uh, a bi-weekly to a semi-monthly pay period because she was outsourcing her payroll and it was going to save her from having to cut two checks a year. Okay, so by doing that, that's that's all well and good. She, she figured out what she could save uh, and we discussed it and I, I encouraged her to have the discussion with her team and to have the discussion frequently and explain how these potential sections of a work week were going to fall outside of the pay periods. Because what we've seen in the past is there's often confusion when it comes to when is overtime due. We've already established overtime is due on a work week basis, not on a pay period basis, but the two get conflated at times. Now with this particular individual, it's kind of funny. We'd worked together uh, a few different times and, and addressed a few different issues. And, and she was really um, reaching out when she had any questions and, she, and wanted to do things really by the book. And about six months after we'd had her initial talk and, and she decided that she was gonna go and change up to that, uh, that semi-monthly pay period, she reached out and, and she said, hey, uh, Logan, can I change back? And I said, well, yeah, you know, as long as you're not doing it to avoid potentially paying overtime, you know, it's up to you as the business owner to establish this. And I, I said, just curious, just out of curiosity, why? And she said, well, I took some of your guidance and I, I determined how much I was going to save by, by issuing those two additional uh, payroll checks through this company we're outsourcing to. And I, I know what my, hourly wages when I when I break down what my time's worth. Uh, and thus far, I have I have cost more than $600 over what the benefit was in issuing those fewer checks based on hours of conversation with the employees. Uh, and she actually had one that ended up filing a wage claim. And there she was not in, in, in the wrong um, once we made a determination, but she did have to go through and get all that documentation. So she had hours upon hours upon hours of doing this. Just a cautionary tale, perfectly legal. However, if you're an employer, anticipate having conversations with your team. Determining your regular rate of pay. So folks can, can uh, be paid on a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, if, as we've discussed. There's just different ways to extrapolate it. So if an employer says, I'm going to pay you $350 a week, that's perfectly permissible as long as they maintain the hours. And for instance, you can see here at 40 hours a week, it'd be 875. Now in the event that drops below minimum wage or overtime comes into play, that's a different issue. Um, but they're all just different methodologies to sort of get to the same place. Weighted average, uh, this is when an individual, for instance, may work uh, a couple different occupations for the same employer at different rates of pay. For this example, let's use a, uh, somebody who's a server for part of the time and a dishwasher or cook for part of the time. So as a server, they make 865 because they're getting tips. As the cook, if they don't have a tip pooling agreement, they're getting 950 an hour. You can see what their hours equate to on straight time. So you take the 46 total hours equals 46640. Then you divide that number by the 46 to get your regular rate of pay. Now you need to pay the halftime rate on top of that. So you can see in this instance, it's 432.92. Now an employer can choose to use a weighted average or they can pay overtime at the higher rate of pay or that higher standard. Uh, in my years of dealing with wage law, I've only seen that happen once. It was a construction business that they had a multitude of varying rates of pay. And the particular individual I saw through the wage claim process, they had, it was either 12 or 13 different rates of pay all within 25 cents 
an hour of one another. So for this company, they determined that it was a better business practice simply to pay at the higher standard rather than having their bookkeeper extrapolate on a weekly basis what that weighted average was going to be. Now we get into the exemptions. We sort of, sort of mentioned prior that uh, refer to overtime and or minimum wage, but also tie in that Fair Labor Standards Act as well as that higher standard principle. So there's education exemptions, there's salesman and car dealership exemptions, there's ag exemptions. The more common exemptions addressed through the Code of Federal Regulations and the MCA or the Montana Code Annotated is the Executive Professional and Administrative. There's a salaries test and a duties test for these. We're going to start with the salary because this is where the higher standard as well as uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act comes into play. So prior to January 1st of this year and for the preceding 20 years or so, the salary threshold for an Executive Professional and Administrative employee was $455 a week. This was addressed the same through the administrative rules of Montana, as well as through the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 29. As of January 1st this year, the salary threshold got raised, I believe it's to 684. However, um, the administrative rules of Montana still reflect the Code of Federal Regulations prior. So that might indicate 455. So now one would have to look at whether the Fair Labor Standards Act applies because if the Fair Labor Standards Act applies, then we're looking at that higher standard principle or the 684 a week. As we've discussed, the vast number of employees in the state um, are covered under that Fair Labor Standards Act. So that raises that, that threshold, even though administrative rule references the prior Code of Federal Regulations, the jurisdictional flowchart, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and the principle of higher standards indicate that it would be that 684 a week. Theoretically, could there be somebody who doesn't fall under that? Certainly. There's always exceptions. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not discuss the exceptions specifically as discuss the rules. If an individual is uh, believes that, that so somebody in their company does not fall under that, 684 a week threshold, I would strongly encourage them to reach out to our office prior to enacting that. Now, all, uh, all exemptions are viewed on a weekly basis. So week by week, they have to be met. Uh, the duties test and the salary both have to be met. So the executive, for instance, they have to oversee um, the enterprise or a subsection thereof, as well as manage two or more full-time employees, have a right to hire, fire, give raises, promotions, demotions, et cetera, or a weighted say in these. So theoretically, there could be a manager of a fast food restaurant with uh, two full-time employees. And if the rest of those hold true, they very well might be an executive exempt employee and they might not be required to be paid for overtime um, or potentially minimum wage, depending upon the number of hours they're working. The administrative, this is by far uh, the most ambiguous of the, of the exemptions. The best breakdown I heard was um, from a manager with the U.S. Department of Labor. And she said she views it as somebody who would not only enact a policy, but would write the policy. So, for instance, oftentimes you'll see HR managers fall under this. And then professional. These are usually associated with a degree. So you can think of uh, architects and engineers. There's also the recognition of uh, talent in a specific noted artistic endeavor, as indicated in this picture. Computer employees, as well as outside salesmen, they both, um, they, they both are addressed as well in various exemptions. Computer employees are a little different. Uh, I believe it's uh, 2763, if memory serves. It's, it's addressed very clearly in, in statute as to the very specific wage that they may, may receive. And they could receive a salary as long as it extrapolates to that wage.
the outside salesman, they truly have to be an outside salesman. They have to be a road warrior. They can't be in the office 60% of the time. They need to be out there. Um, the predominance, the, the way the feds outline this is the predominance of their work has to take place outside of a fixed office. So now when are wages due? Um, there's a slight variance here and depending upon if the individual is still employed or not. If the individual is still employed, wages are due within 10 business days of the end of a pay period, cut and dry. If an individual is not employed, if they've been let go, wages are due immediately within four hours of the end of a business day, unless there's a pre-existing written condition, which can extend that to the next scheduled payday, not to exceed 14 calendar days from the end of a pay period. Why one portion says 10 business days and the other says 14 calendar days, I couldn't tell you far above my pay grade, but you can think of it as two weeks, roughly that you're dealing with the same sort of situation. For employers, if you don't have a policy in place and you don't want to cut a live check, it's a good opportunity to, to go ahead and update your, your employee handbook and enact that policy if you wish. Um, it's better, especially for small businesses and in the vast majority of businesses within our state are classified as small businesses, having to cut that live check or pull money out of the till to pay that individual. So the slides to indicate withholdings, right? So withholdings for damages, mistakes, shortages, and uh, on the right is to withhold for lodging, which by the way is permissible. It's outlined the exact percentage that may be offset in statute. Obviously, I don't believe that the, uh, the cozy abode pictured here would likely meet that standard. However, if an employer is going to utilize that as they do often in the ag industry, I would just really refer them to look through that statute because it, it outlines very specifically the percentage that may be offset. Um, so that top picture in this instance, you have a chef that dropped a plate of food. You could likewise think of a server who drops a tray uh, or a server who has a table dine and dash. None of that can be withheld from that um, employee's paycheck. So, you know, for the, let's say the, the chef dropping food or the server routinely dropping trays of food, it might be a coaching opportunity for that employer to have with that employee and, and look at uh, potentially seeing what needs to be rectified as far as their performance goes. But what it's not is it's not an opportunity with, to withhold those wages. If a, uh, if a table uh, or I, rather a server's um, taking care of a table and those customers get up and bail, they run out the door without paying, they can't withhold that from their wages. If likewise you have a bartender or a, um, or a clerk that their till is short, that shortage can't be withheld from their wages. In the bottom example here, you have some uh, creative uh, heavy equipment operating, it appears. Um, again, this is a coaching opportunity. What it's not is it's not an opportunity for that employer to withhold the wages of that employee. Um, for instance, I received a call about a year ago from a HR manager of a company, I'm sorry, a payroll manager that the, uh, that the CEO had ordered her to withhold their insurance deductible, which I believe was $500 in this instance, from an individual's wages because this individual had hit a customer's car with a forklift. That's not permissible by law. Um, honestly, it's one of the risks of, of doing business. They had insurance for a reason. What it is, and I discussed with her, you might want to have this guy take some training. It's potentially there's, there's an avenue for disciplinary action. I don't get involved in disciplinary action. There's not an entity within the state that does unless you're addressing um, and unless it happens to go into the matter of, uh, of discrimination of a protected class. So if the employer deems that it's, if there's some corrective action that needs to be done, uh, that that's within their business policy issue. What it's not is it's not an opportunity to withhold wages. I'll back up really quick. So I had an, an instance here and uh, it's one of those instances that's sort of eye-opening because it shows that what people uh, think of as right and what meets the, the letter of the law can be two different things. There was an individual, uh, they owned a very large ranch. Uh, it was an elderly couple. 
They had multiple ranch houses scattered over their their large sprawling ranch, and the uh, the gentleman uh, of the husband of the of the couple that ran the ranch, we were getting up there in age, and he only made the rounds about every two weeks. So he'd go see everybody. He he had this particular gentleman who ended up filing a wage claim as his last check was withheld. Well, during the investigation, it turned out that this individual had left two weeks before the uh, the employer realized it because he was making the rounds and he left his three dogs in this particular ranch house he cut open a 50 pound bag of dog food and left two five gallon pails of water for the dogs however he left them locked up in this house um, and as the owner of three springer spaniels myself i can't imagine what the inside of that particular property looked like uh, understandably, the business owner was incredibly irritated, withhold the, withheld the wages. We discussed it once a wage claim was filed. I said, you very well might have civil action you could take against this individual. What you can't do is legally withhold their wages. In this instance, I believe they paid him and then they shook him to court. Whatever happened to it from there, I have no idea. So wage and hour records, it, it varies. It's different from other um, agency standards. For our purposes, records have to be tain, retained for three years. I talked to a company outside of Sydney the other day. They had 58 years worth of records. So they had gone above and beyond. Uh, it was time for them to adjust their processes. But for us, it is three years. As we've discussed, just like whether somebody gets paid weekly, bi-weekly, et cetera, the methodology for payment can vary as well. Hourly commission, piece rate, salary, et cetera. As long as overtime and applicable minimum wage laws are met, it doesn't matter. That's up to a, a discussion between the employer and employee or market constraints, right? Clearly there are industries and particular markets that choose to, to pay on a certain, certain basis. Salary plus commission is pretty common in a lot of sales industries. Here, what you're looking at is uh, whether or not these uh, breaks, training periods, preparatory and concluding activities or on-call time need to be paid. So we'll start in the top left. That's to indicate what a, what a, a employer I talked to about a month ago referred to as a tailgate meeting. It's essentially a time before a shift where they're indicating what everybody's going to do for the day. That's paid time. The prism to think of through this is, is the company benefiting? And if the company is truly benefiting and the employee is suffered or permitted to work, then likely it's going to be paid time. To the right there, this gentleman mopping the floor, uh, that would be viewed as preparatory or concluding activities. It's paid time. Bottom left, trainings um, are another issue. There's a four-part administrative rule that addresses whether or not these these times have to be paid and all four criteria must be met in order for the time not to be paid. Um, I won't go through them verbatim, but one of them you're looking at is that it takes place outside of the company time and that it's uh, completely voluntary. Oh, and the company, it's not related at all the individual's job and no work's per been performed. Yeah, I've worked in a multitude of industries um, and for uh, you know a, a, a few different jobs within the state and I have yet to have somebody pay me to go to training or uh, rather somebody allow me to go to training during the day that is not uh, beneficial to my employer and doesn't pertain to my job. On call time. So the act of simply carrying a cell phone or a pager, or we'll say if anybody still does that, I think they do in the medical community, isn't in and of itself so restrictive to be viewed as work time. That comes from a Supreme Court decision. Uh, in that particular instance, there was an individual who was required to carry a cell phone and they could not leave the city of Missoula city limits, I do believe was the case. In that instance, it still wasn't deemed that it was so restrictive. She could go to work or rather she could go to the movie she could go to dinner, she could go grocery shop and whatever. It's even been found that they can indeed say you can't consume alcohol because you may have to, uh, or yeah, you can't consume alcohol and you can't be above a legal limit because you may be required to drive or you may be required to use judgment. 
that 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 might offset and that's still not been viewed as so restrictive um in the event that an individual is on call and that phone rings and they answer a question, that's paid time. And that time will go towards that work week. And if they're a non-exempt employee, that will most certainly contribute to that overtime. So for instance, you can think of a, a maintenance worker for a manufacturing facility. If they work five, eight hour shifts, Monday through Friday, and they're, they're required to maintain a phone on the weekend and that phone rings, they're on work time. If they have then to drive in to fix something at that facility, likely that drive time is also going to be paid in that specific instance when generally that is viewed as home to work time, but because they're on call and what they're doing, it likely would be viewed as uh, rather as paid time. Sleep time. So a shift of 24 hours or longer, it is permissible for an employer to have a policy which can deduct up to eight hours of sleep time if the employee is provided quarters to sleep and provided that time completely removed from duty. Sort of the ugly portion of that is it's not specifically addressed um, that that time all has to be consecutive. So theoretically, an individual could be provided for two hour shifts, though I've never seen that uh, in practice and in general, that it's a practice that is not widely used. Shifts less than 24 hours, all that time's paid time. You can't, you can't deduct for sleep time. Rest breaks and meal periods. This is an area of confusion. However, it's really pretty simple. The state of Montana nor federal law requires rest breaks or meal periods. Simple as that. It's uh, often customary. Employers often choose to do it due to either their view on constraints of the market or their look uh, look to create a culture. Um, and there have been a lot of studies that show the benefits and productivity benefits of it as an aside, but there's not a law mandating it. The only law that addresses it is that in the state of Montana, if the time is going to not be paid time, it's viewed as a meal period. That needs to be at least 30 minutes in duration and the employee needs to be completely removed from duty. So for instance, you could have a retail establishment where people are, let's say somebody had a, uh, uh, an eight and a half hour shift with a mandated 30 minute lunch, perfectly fine. Now in the event that this particular uh, theoretical shop gets busy and that manager drops his head in and tells the employee that, hey, we need to get you out front and it's 29 minutes into their 30 minute break or 30 minute meal period, then all that time's paid. They could then give them a complete 30 minute session, uh, completely removed from duty later in the day and that wouldn't be paid, but that particular time would have to be paid. Home to work, all in a day's work and away from the home community. And I'll preface this by saying the uh, USDOL came out with a new um, opinion piece addressing this, but it's really largely still the same prism. And, and it's, it's very similar to that of the meetings, right? That if the employer benefits and they're mandating it and the employee is suffered and or permitted, it's likely paid time. So in a non-pandemic environment, home to work, we can say, I work in an office in Helena. I live just outside Helena. Me driving to the office in Helena, that's home to work. I've, I've never been paid for that time. Um, all in a day's work. So in this instance, we have a lady appears to work for a cleaning company. So let's say that she has to drive to the office in the morning to get her list of places she's going to clean as well as pick up supplies. So from her home or wherever she's staying to that office, that's going to be home to work. Now every stop she makes to all of those subsequent um, customers and then back to the main office, that's all in a day's work. So let's jump back really quick and I apologize for not addressing this prior, but in home to work, what happens if an individual does not have a fixed business location? So let's say, the construction industry. Well, likely, unless the employer is mandating that they ride in a company vehicle or mandating that they pick up supplies or mandating uh, other confines, then likely wherever that job site is, is home to work. Um, if they say, you know, let's say it's a company out of Helena and there's a project they're working on in Belgrade and they say, be ready at that project at 8 a.m. You don't have to drive a company vehicle. You don't have to ride in a company vehicle. You don't have to stop for materials or tools or pick anybody else up along the way. We're not going to communicate during that period of time. Then it likely doesn't have to be paid. 
now here's where the market dictates things a little bit differently. I'm aware of a construction company that was, uh, wasn't paying for this time. However, they were working on a rather large project and it actually was down outside of Belgrade. And that particular project, the, it turned out that the other contractors realized that one contractor wasn't, wasn't offering their guys travel pay. And they started to try to attempt to, to poach or uh, bring, bring those, those employees into the fold on the, with their business. Well, that contractor rightly understood the writing was on the wall, the constraints of the market. He started to offer that time as paid time. Now, in the event that a company decides to allow people to carpool, that's not necessarily going to be uh, paid time unless they mandate it or unless they give instructions to that individual along the way where it sort of becomes one of the ideas of the, that uh, tailgate meeting only in the confines of a vehicle away from the home community. So that would be, for instance, if this was, again, a non-pandemic environment, let's say this was a early morning presentation, I'd likely drive down to the Bozeman area the evening before to not have to make that drive, especially this time of year, in the dark, early. Uh, it's not like we ever get weather issues between here and, and Bozeman. Um, I particularly like that, uh, you know, that, that stretch on the interstate. Um, but that would be paid time. Now I get to the hotel, I'm free to do what I want. That's not paid time. I wake up in the morning, I answer business emails, I, I drive to the job service or wherever the, uh, wherever we may be giving this discussion. That's going to be that's going to be paid time. And then my drive back to the office, that's paid time. I get back to the office, I park the state rig, I put things in my truck, and I start to head home. The minute I I'm done with state business and I'm ready to drive on my own to from my work to my home, that's then viewed as home to work. Sick time, vacation pay, holiday pay. PTO, none of them required by law. They very well might be addressed in a union agreement or collective bargaining agreement. That's not what we're discussing here. We're discussing requirements of law as well. And this is of course in the private sector. Uh, the only really area of note here is that as we discussed prior, they don't apply towards overtime laws. And also that in the event that it is PTO, that's completely reflective on a company policy. So theoretically, there could be a use it or lose it policy where vacation has been deemed and payable as wages. This is both th through Supreme Court and AG opinions. So if it's vacation, that time can't be lost. If it's PTO, it's reflective upon the company policy. If a company utilizes PTO and chooses not to follow their policy, so for instance, there was a wage claim several years ago where an individual uh, company, an individual filed against a company for two weeks of PTO time. The company provided their PTO policy. Their policy said, we don't pay. That individual said, hey, I know the last six people who've been separated from employment with this employer and they paid each one of those individuals. We contacted those people. Sure enough, they paid, talked to the employer and they said, well, all those people were, were good and their separation was nice. This guy was kind of a jerk and, and, you know, sort of sort of gave us the finger and walked out. So we didn't want to pay him. And that's what our policy says. Well, the problem there is they established a precedent that negated their policy by their actions. They established a new policy. So I strongly encourage an employer create a policy and live by that policy. So we got the gentleman counting change in the bottom left here. Uh, raises aren't required by law. Itemized statements of deductions are, so that's often referred to as a pay stub. However, there again, just like uh, re addressed prior, there's not a methodology um, requirement. So it could be written on a napkin and made a photocopy of, or it could be QuickBooks or professional payroll service. As long as the records are kept and they're accurate, it meets the minimum requirements of the law. Above that, again, uh, breaks, whether it's a cigarette break uh, or any other sort of break, doesn't have to be permitted um, in maintaining records of time. So this is imperative that, again, methodology isn't addressed, but it's imperative and required by rule and statute that employers, A, offer the itemized statement of deduction to every employee, and they have to maintain those records, and likewise have to maintain records of the hours worked. It would clearly be rather difficult to have one set of records without the other. Um, and the hours worked, how they're maintaining that, that methodology isn't 
addressed either. It could be a electronic pay clock like this. Apps are becoming more popular. Matter of fact, the US DLL has a free, uh, a free app people can utilize on their, on their cell phone. Um, or, you know, a year ago, I looked it up and you could get one of those old style punch clocks where you pull the lever and it, and it stamps the date and time on like a manila card. Uh, it was 200 cards and a punch clock for a hundred bucks on Amazon prime. The first time an employer has to dig through and come up with records, it's going to negate the cost of that hundred dollars. Um, if their time's worth anything. And again, through the, uh, through the wage claim process, they might have to come up with three years worth of records. So maintaining those records is imperative. In the event a wage claim is filed, and I, I will say, I'm sorry, everybody. I know we're, we're sort of drinking through a fire hose today. We're covering a lot of ground. I'll try to wrap this up as expeditiously as possible to address any questions, but feel free on the back end to reach out. If we don't have time for that today, um, you can reach out directly through an email I will give here in a bit and we'll address any and all questions. In the event a wage claim is filed with our office, we analyze to determine whether it's an our jurisdiction, as well as meets the statute of limitations. We investigate during the investigatory process. We are a non-biased third party. We don't represent either side. If wages are due, penalties may apply, and we will most certainly a attempt to aid in the recovery of any wages found due. And then both parties have appeal rights. Youth employment, there's age restrictions, hour restrictions, hazardous occupation listed in jurisdiction. Age restrictions, this uh, most often is associated with our restrictions, but it is also associated with hazardous occupations. By far the best resource out there is youthrules.gov. The Montana Youth Employment Act completely mirrors the federal child labor laws. Strongly encourage people if they're going to employ uh, children or minors to look at both our website as well as the feds. It's not nearly as daunting as folks think they are. It's really fairly cut and dry. There are hazardous occupations listed and they make sense. Um, you know, they can't be a lumberjack, right? Uh, in a, in a mall, they can't do roofing. And as they get older, the permission changes. Uh, our restrictions, these are for 14 and 15 year olds. So people have to be 14 years old or older to work uh, in the state of Montana, 14 and 15 year olds can't work more than three hours a day um, during a school week. They can't work more than 18 hours a week in a school week. Uh, during a non-school week, they can't work more than 40 hours. And in, in a non-school day, they can't work more than eight hours. If an individual is homeschooled or like in our current environment, if they are doing online education or remote learning, they go by the schedule of the school district that they are in. So whatever the local municipal school district is. Registered apprenticeship program. This is a great opportunity. It sounds like this is going to be addressed further later. Uh, but real quick, that 16 years old and older, there's opportunities for employers to register with the apprenticeship bureau and then bring on youth employees that then through that program might be able to uh, might be able to enter into occupations that would otherwise be deemed hazardous. For instance, a lady in our office, her and her husband own a, a meat packing facility and processing facility. So with that, their 16 year old son, they became a part of the registered apprenticeship program. Their 16 year old son was able to then go and work with his father and and grandfather uh, and go through that program. And not only at the, uh, you know, at, at the end of it, did he have a usable skill, but he got to work with, with two separate generations other than himself, which is cool in its own right. Prevailing wage, what is it? How does it affect me in jurisdiction? Basically, you can think of it as a minimum wage for, for uh, publicly funded projects. Montana Little Davis Bacon Act. This is for state, municipality, district, ditch district, political subdivisions, school district, et cetera, projects exceeding $25,000. This can be for construction or non construction. They're all delineated on our website. Uh, each one gives rate schedules. So individuals going to bid those projects can go and see what that hourly minimum wage is, as well as often there's fringe benefits. And those benefits can either be paid as cash. So directly as hour for hour or dollar for hour of work, or they can be put into things like 401k, health insurance, et cetera. But the key there is it has to be an irrevocable trust accessed by the employee. Federally funded projects are not within our jurisdiction. What's in our jurisdiction is state funded projects. 
So what we do within ERD, we conduct yearly surveys. There's a statistician who takes those surveys, crunches all the numbers, does equations that I don't even want to think of, and then they establish the new rates for use on public works projects. We inspect and audit payroll records. We investigate wage claims. We conduct on-site visits. And like today, we talk to people about it. And if there's questions, people reach out to us. And that is it. Is there any questions? And again, I'm sorry I had to run through that so quick. I just wanted to make sure we touched on all bases. Great. No, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I know there's a lot of information. We'll give it a second for questions to come in. We do have one question, Logan. Uh, it reads, are there any exemptions for nonprofit executive directors in the salaries or duties tests? Well, whether it's, um, you know, if they fall under the FLSA and they very well, they very well might, if, if it's an executive exemption, it's an executive exemption. So that would be the manage, um, manage the enterprise or a subsection thereof, oversee two or more full-time employees, um, as well as have the right to hire, fire, or a weighted say in it, and then meet that 684 a week. Um, there all, are also some different um, twists when it comes to nonprofits, but in general, if it's going to be a paid position, it has to be a paid position. Great, thank you. Yeah, certainly, and I'll take the opportunity real quick because I said I would give it out. Um, questions if they arise. You can always call our office. I maintain it as well as um, auditors and investigators, a phone number that's 444-6543 or an email address that I maintain. I monitor as well as a couple other managers. They monitor it. It's a D-L-I-E-R-D wage, W-A-G-E at MT.gov. Um, and, you know, obviously, if anybody looks up ERD, they can find that. But any questions? I have, I have employers that have chosen to reach out to me uh, anonymously, and that's great. I don't, I'm no longer an investigator. I don't have the ability to write determinations or to penalize people. My whole goal now is to educate. Um, so if I can have these discussions, I don't care whether you want to be called John or Jane Doe, or you want to tell me who you really are. I literally had a conversation earlier today with someone that it initially started as an anonymous complaint and through talking over talking with things. Now I'm on my fourth call with this employer and now they just reach out when they have questions and we talk through the process. And if you guys are unsure whether or not it falls within our jurisdiction, reach out. If it's not us, I'll get you in contact with who it is. Great. Thanks for that information. And I know Rebecca was able to put it up in the chat. So thank you, Rebecca, on that. Logan, I did have one question. Um, you've, you may have got this within the last week. We had something that came in where an employee was, was fired for stealing and a question came in to us. We referred it over to Wage and Hour, but the question came in as I have the last paycheck. All the material hasn't been returned. We got an investigation going on with it, with the cops and everything. Do I hold the last paycheck or do you know I send it and then get the merchant back and, and go that route on legal wise? Um, and I know you've mentioned before that, yes, you always have to pay the last paycheck, but I didn't know if this was different if they're they're stealing. Yeah, and, and thank you, Tanner. That's great. I didn't see that one, but this is sort of a unique one. that It pops up a few times a year. Um, it's outlined in statute. There are very clear measures that have to, like de deliverable dates that have to be met. So you're looking at charges have to be filed within a competent jurisdiction with X amount of time. Um, uh, the, it has to go to court within X amount of time. So theoretically, an employer can withhold for theft as long as they file those charges and they meet every outline in statute. Now, one of the things that does stay in statute is they have to retain that obviously off to the side because in the event that it goes to court and that individual is found not guilty, then, then it's due immediately, and it right? Yep. So, the, the, and, but that is very, it's another one of those statutes like the withholding for lodging where it is, very clear that I would strongly encourage an employer to make sure they're touching each one of those milestones before they, before they choose to go that route. Great. Thank you. Most and, it, and it looks like we had one other question that came in. If you got another minute or so. I'm good. Yeah. All right. Do actual work 
times have to be listed on the timesheet if they are hourly employee. They have their schedule on an Outlook calendar, but do not write it on a timesheet. Yeah, I mean, if they're paid by the hour, then yeah, I mean, certain rounding practices can happen. Uh, that's permissible, but it can't always benefit one party. That's that's the the sort of the prism to look at it through. It can be done on a quarter hour basis or fifteen minute basis, but it can't always benefit one side or the other. Um, but it is strongly encouraged for a employer to always maintain accurate records of hours worked. Um, there's, it's never an issue till there's an issue. And generally speaking, there's an issue upon separation of employment when the relationship is soured. And then now that employer, for instance, might have to come up with the last three years worth of records on what hours specifically were worked and what pay was made because some investigator in Helena is going to have to crunch those numbers and determine whether or not it, that individual is paid properly. Does that answer the question? Oop, looks like you're muted there, Tanner. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, was, no worries, my friend. I was going on and on. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, I answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I was muted. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you so much, Logan. Yep. And we got a couple other ones coming in here. Um, do you help with wage determinations, the appropriate pay, when looking at switching position employees from hour, hourly to salary? Is that something that you could help out with? Well, I can I can let them know what the law is. It's going to be a business decision. Um, as long as minimum wage is paid in overtime, it's constraints of the market in a contractual discussion. And we, we don't act as a go-between. Um, every market's going to be different. For instance, I mean, I know it comes as no surprise, hiring somebody in Bozeman is going to be slightly different market constraints than hiring somebody in Libby. It's just the nature of it. But from our perspective, we're looking at the minimums, which is that baseline. Everything above the minimum is a matter of market constraints and contractual discussions. Now, if an individual or an employer or an individual wants to discuss whether or not they meet the exemption, please reach out. Um, and we can discuss that. And again, those exemptions are viewed on a week by week basis. So if they're applying that, they need to make sure that for every week that that duties test is being met. Great, thank you. We had one that came in about the just getting con contact information again. I'm going to send that four 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 six five four three number, and then D L I E R D wage at mt dot gov. Yep. Yeah. Please, and everybody, feel free to reach out. I know a lot of times stuff isn't going to be on your mind today. It's not topical, but in six weeks, in two weeks, whatever the case might be. Uh, you know, uh, send it over. I will encourage people if you reach out via email, it is always beneficial to include a phone number. Most of these issues are so intertwined with other issues. Talking through the, the, the issue gives us the best ability to help you and advise appropriately. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Logan. That looks like the questions. Um, Sorry, we, uh, we're, we're getting another one. I could help on an HR consultant. Oh, okay, great. So Carrie Grass, she, she mentioned out that she could help with that question. She is an HR consultant. Her phone number is 406-570-4253. Um, with regards to, I think it's Renee's question on, we feel we meet the exemptions, but we are more like, looking at appropriate salary, salary pay following the hour, hourly rate to incorporate previous overtime pay. So um, you, you're more than welcome to, to send those questions in to that DLI ERD wage and they could get back to you. And then even Carrie is mentioning that she could help out with and her phone number again is 406-570-4253 or 4257. Great, thank you. Great, well, Logan. Thank you, that everybody. Looks, that looks like we, we have it. So thank you so much. You did wonderful, and thanks for helping out the ABC Clinic. Yep. Thank you, Tanner, and thanks, everybody, for attending today. Everybody have a great day. Take care.
Thanks. All right. Next, we have up uh, Mark Manicky with the uh, vocational rehabilitations. Hi, Mark. Hey, good afternoon, Tanner. Happy Happy Thursday. <laughs> happy Thursday to you too, as well. Um, if you wanted to maybe get your PowerPoint up, and we'll kind of take a peek at that. Oh, there it is. Um, let me just make sure I got all these questions cleared and whatnot. Perfect. All right. So we got Mark with the, the vocational rehabilitation. Mark is a business service specialist for the vocational rehabilitation and blind services program. He has 40 years of experience working in various programs that provide services to individuals with disabilities. As a business service specialist, Mark coordinates business outreach efforts to assist Montana businesses. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for helping out the ABC Clinic. I'll let you take it away. Great, well, thank you, Tanner. And I, I wanna thank our host uh, for uh, allowing me some time today. Um, uh, this is a, a real pleasure to be able to uh, talk to our uh, businesses. And uh, originally I thought it was going to be uh, uh, Bozeman area businesses. And I see by the roster that we have businesses from across the state. and. I uh, am going to talk about our program, the Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services Program. We are a publicly funded program under uh, Department of Health, Public Health and Human Services. Um, we are celebrating our uh, 100th anniversary as a public, publicly funded program. Um, and I, I bring that up because uh, that uh, gives us a, a kind of a depth and breadth of experience uh, whereby we can assist businesses uh, based upon our Depth, depth and breadth of experience. For the most part, uh, up until uh, the, the middle uh, 2014, our, our focus was uh, helping individuals with disabilities to prepare for, obtain and maintain employment. And our focus was helping them uh, get, get back into the work world. Uh, in 2014, uh, our uh, federal partner uh, really wanted us to start focusing on what's called a dual customer approach. And that is looking at businesses and what businesses need. Um, it was one thing for us to prepare people to enter the workforce, but it was another for us to understand what the workforce needs are. And so we began a, a program uh, called Business Services, and we began doing outreach to businesses and uh, doing things such as today, uh, working with the assistance of business clinics. Um, we also are involved across the state um, with other community uh, programs uh, or uh, organizations like Chambers of Commerce, uh, the Job Service Employer Councils, uh, the Society of Human Resource Managers. But the idea is to, to reach out to our uh, business community uh, and try to learn more about uh, what their needs may be and how we may be able to help meet their needs and meet their business goals. As I said, we have uh, 100 years of experience doing this. And so uh, I ask our uh, participants today to think of us as a resource on the, the variety of aspects in regards to disability. Um, we have worked uh, with all, all manner of individuals, uh, we, uh, all manner of uh, disabling conditions, uh, the impairments associated with those, uh, with those disabilities. And so uh, we are uh, available for consultation if there's questions in regards to specific disabilities or impairments. Um, and how those impairments may affect work, how they may affect job performance. Um, and so uh, we, we are available across the state. We are a statewide program. I'm the statewide coordinator, but we have individuals in most of the major cities um, that can help, help you with your needs. Um, excuse me. When I, uh, we also uh, are connected in our communities with other resources uh, that may be able to help out. Um, we partner with adult education and the job service. You'll be hearing from uh, Montana Apprenticeship in a little while. Uh, we work with the independent living centers around the state. Um, and so if there's something that we may not be able to answer, uh, we may have a resource to help you out. Um, I want to mention that you might hear it a couple more times. These are free, free services. Um, we are a publicly funded program. And so uh, the consultation or the advice or 
uh, time that we spend with you uh, is free. Um, these are things that uh, we are able to provide to the business community. I mentioned uh, disability and how it may affect work. Uh, we can provide technical assistance on job modifications uh, as a result of disability, or if someone has acquired a disability uh, while working, um, I'll do a disclaimer. We're not workers comp, uh, we're not OSHA. OSHA. Um, we, we don't uh, provide legal advice, but we can consult. Um, we have developed relationships with employers across the state, and sometimes that's just a conversation. Um, a question comes up, and we're happy to, to field that question. And we also uh, will uh, keep in mind our role and scope uh, in, in regards to this. We, uh, we won't make a legal uh, uh, judgment, um, and I've and, and, uh, for, uh, given my time uh, in this program, I have been asked to render um, statements, and, and I, that's not my place. Uh, we are a, a, a resource for you. And uh, we would like to think that we can have just a conversation about things. Um, as I said, uh, going back to the slide there, as far as technical assistance, because of our knowledge of disability impairment, we can provide uh, information on job modifications, how a person uh, may adapt to, to their uh, job if a disability is uh, creating an issue. Uh, we can help with uh, uh, looking at assistive technology Assistive technology is things like phone amplifiers or, or visual uh, warning systems versus a, a, um, a, an auditory uh, system. Uh, we can give advice uh, and co consultation on accessibility in regards to um, your uh, application format, uh, your website information. Um, uh, we can help uh, give uh, uh, hints and tips on that. Um, we can perform job analysis within, within a, a certain level. We're not experts, but we can help you look at jobs to see if there are uh, possible modifications that can be made uh, to assist an individual. Um, again, uh, these things are, are free to you. Um, we can also help with employee retention. Um, oftentimes with um, individuals uh, as we age, um, as life happens, uh, people acquire disabilities or they may uh, uh, become uh, less able to perform some of their duties, that could be a conversation we have uh, whereby we start uh, talking about what resources might help that individual. Is it a public resource? Is it a private resource? Um, it, uh, we, we have a lot of ex experience in this area. And we bring up, uh, I, I bring up acquired disability because of uh, 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 a lot of times in, in, in the world of work, um, if it's not a worker's comp issue, it might just be an aspect of life. Uh, it might be residual uh, impairments related to cancer treatment. Um, we're yet to see the effects of COVID, um, what those long-term effects may be for individuals. Uh, hearing and eyesight are things that we uh, talk to employers about, whereby an individual may uh, have re reduced um, uh, uh, seeing acuity or uh, their hearing has been affected. And so we could provide some information about um, uh, things that you might be able to do um, or, uh, to, to help the individual. Oftentimes, uh, job modifications are, are at no cost or a very low cost, um, and we can uh, help with that. Again, uh, in looking at the in, in retention, a job analysis might be helpful um, it, it, to take a look at the job a little more closely to see if there may be a way to uh, provide an alternative uh, a job description for the individual, um, shared duties, uh, changing, uh, uh, per, uh, excuse me, uh, expectations, things like that. We can also help with candidate recruitment uh, because uh, of our long history helping individuals with disabilities enter work. Uh, we work with individuals um, every day that are preparing for and uh, looking for work. Um, and as far as recruitment, um, understanding your needs, uh, we may be able to help uh, make that fit um, and help facilitate um, a fit for you. Uh, we can do that through a variety of means. Uh, there's a, a couple things that we utilize are like a paid internship or what's called a work experience uh, or an OJT where our program is actually paying wages uh, for a training period. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about apprenticeships. Uh, we have uh, helped facilitate uh, getting an individual uh, prepared to enter an apprenticeship. 
but the, the candidate recruitment, uh, understanding your needs, uh, we may be able to help you uh, develop a pipeline uh, from our program to your program or your program to your business um, so that we can meet your needs. Um, the, the internships, the, the uh, you know, the paid internship or work experience is kind of like a try before you buy, uh, maybe an opportunity for you to uh, take a, a longer look at an individual uh, to see if there would be a fit. Uh, it also gives the individual uh, a longer look uh, at your, at your business to see if that might be a fit for them. Um, so uh, in like an on the job training or a work-based, uh, like a learning, uh, work-based learning experience, um, those things may not have an oblig those may not have an obligation to hire at the end. Um, it, it is a way for for you to uh, look at an individual and the individual look at you. Um, and uh, if it if it's a match, you be, and uh, you, you move ahead. Um, we can also help uh, understand with the candidate recruitment. Um, as we understand the needs of a business, we may uh, communicate to our uh, uh, the clients that we serve. Uh, that there's a need in the area um, and help uh, uh, possibly uh, um, promote the training that they would that they would need. Uh, in eastern Montana there for a while there was a real need for CDLs um, for uh, the, the oil patch and uh, our, our program responded by uh, looking for increased training opportunities for our clients to meet the need of business by getting CDLs. Um, so we can help with a training that would that would meet your needs. Um, lastly, we can help with disability awareness training. Um, we are we have a, a program called Windmills uh, that has a, a variety of modules that help with um, understanding a disability. Um, Windmills is based on the idea that uh, people's perceptions and people's uh, attitudes toward disability affect uh, their behavior. Uh, and therefore, the modules um, through a, a pretty, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, kind of a fun-filled uh, conversation uh, that's uh, non-threatening, uh, people can start to look at their attitudes and understand maybe their perceptions and how those attitudes and perceptions affect their actions. Um, and uh, we have those available. Um, we have trainers across the state. Uh, we can provide them in person, kind of, but mostly virtual right now. And they talk about things like accommodations for disability, um, uh, disability fact or fiction. What's what's true and not true? Um, uh, we have a, a, a module on traumatic brain injury. Uh, we have one on mental health. Uh, so there's a variety. Uh, if you were interested in that, uh, uh, you could contact one of our local representatives. Uh, you'll see my name and uh, Darren uh, Height Rennie's name uh, in the next slide. Uh, I'm the statewide contact, so I. We'll put my information up, and so if you if you had a question uh, that rises uh, about windmills or about anything I talked about today, uh, you can you can uh, pop me a note, and I'm happy to uh, you know respond to that, and then also I refer you to the the, the local business service specialist. So um, that is me in a nutshell, and a vocational I shouldn't be say me in a nutshell, but that's vocational rehabilitation of blind services in a nutshell. Um, in, in regards to how we may be able to help businesses. Um, I'm going to move toward my next slide. Uh-oh. Why am I not being able to do that? Um, you might be able to just to there scroll we go. down. Oh, did you get it? Yep. Okay. I had to use my keyboard. I'm sorry. I was trying to get to the screen uh, there, Tanner. But uh, oh, yeah. yeah, no worries. Any questions uh, before I sign off? Uh, there's my contact. I'm Mark. And then there's Darren's information. Doesn't look like we have any questions that are as of right now, but we'll give it a second. I do have to follow up on the the windmills training that you were talking about. It's a phenomenal training. It's great. I went through it, I believe, four or five years ago. Um, we, we had it with a lot of the job service folks to mm -hmm. help out, and and so for everybody out there to know that job service could could potentially help out if they still have a certified trainer on that. If not, work with with Mark and his team. Um, but Mark will to reach out to their job services if they don't have somebody in the local area. The the training is phenomenal. It, it just gives you the better understanding, the awareness, 
Um, a lot of times we, we may have a fear uh, tied to a, a certain disability or disabilities, but we don't know how to act. We don't know if we're overacting. So it's just uh, kind of assuring to see, and it, it's, it's, it's great to have. So I, I would recommend anybody to have that um, and do that training if, they, if time allows. Mark, we really appreciate your your, your time. Um, you I was able to get your slides up on the website. So again, that's the ABC Clinic website. You'll be able to see it under the vocational rehabilitation uh, tab there. And yeah, Mark, I appreciate it. Thank you for helping out the ABC Clinics this year. Well, thank you, Tanner. Thank everybody for participation, uh, for, for participating today, sorry. Got tongue tied. Uh, if you do have questions, as I said, uh, I'm always here. Uh, just drop me a note and I'm happy to uh, get you where you need to go or answer your question. So thanks a lot for your time today and have a great weekend, a great holiday. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Stay safe out there. All right. Well, I think we're doing pretty good. We, we, uh, we have one more presentation. We have Lindsay up. Lindsay, it looks like you made it back. Um, I know you had to step out for a second. So we're I right did, on yes. time. So yeah, no worries. I had a, I had a little piece that I was going to go over if needed. Um, but we're, we're sitting good. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Lindsay is going to go over to the registered apprenticeship program, the Montana Registered Apprenticeship Program. So Lindsay, without further ado, thank you so much and will you take it away? All right. I will share my screen. Yeah, I um, just presented to some uh, elementary kids or some middle school kids. So I'm switching gears to grownups now. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Yes, all right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, perfect. And to intro to the registered apprenticeship. Yep. All right. Um, so as Tanner introduced me, I am Lindsay Mitchell. I am with the Montana Registered Apprenticeship. I am a special programs coordinator. Um, and I am in the Bozeman, um, at Bozeman to Billings, all the way over to the North Dakota's kind of the southeastern swath of the state. Um, so we cover big areas for sure. Um, and it's, it's very diverse in Montana, obviously, like a lot of us know, um, which makes it fun, makes it interesting. Um, so registered apprenticeship, um, what do a computer programmer, an electrician, an office manager, a home health aide, and a wind turbine technician have in common? Well, they're actually all occupations that can be learned through apprenticeship. So 75 years ago, in the, when the apprenticeship system started, um, construction and skilled trades were the main um, jobs learned through the apprenticeship program. Um, but now federally, we have over a thousand occupations. Um, those include careers in healthcare, information technology, advanced ma manufacturing, transportation, logistics, and energy. Um, so yeah, we cover a huge swath. We're not just um, working with plumbers and electricians anymore. Um, and we're constantly doing outreach, visiting with businesses to uh, see if apprenticeship, the apprenticeship training model is right for them. Um, so just a little background and context. Um, so registered apprenticeship, we are housed in the Department of Labor uh, in industry. Um, it was established in 1941 um, and we work with union and non-union businesses. So that is kind of a little bit of a misconception. Sometimes I think people think that apprenticeship is just union, um, but we do work with the unions. Um, the unions have just really highly embraced the apprenticeship training model. Um, and then, yeah, I had a few notes here, but we don't want to go through them all. Um, so what is uh, apprenticeship? So apprenticeship really right now, and especially with our expansion, um, we are the, the apprenticeship training model. It's, it's really a, an answer to the call of the workforce shortage. Um, we all, we all know that in Montana, well, actually nationally, um, we have a workforce shortage. I, I, overwhelm, I visit with a lot of businesses and I overwhelmingly hear them tell me, um, there's nobody who wants to work. Um, well, I'm not sure if that's true. Um, there, I can find you a warm body, but um, it might not be 
um, the warm body you're looking for. And the reason for that is because they're not a fully trained worker. Um, they're not a skilled worker. So um, apprenticeship, we are gonna take those warm bodies, um, those individuals with no skill or low skills um, that fit your business. Um, they might have skills, but maybe not the skills for your business. And we're gonna try to bring them up. We are gonna bring them up to a fully trained worker. Um, and so with the tra apprenticeship training model, we're combining the on-the-job training. So that's just the hours that they're working, um, just their day in, day out, working alongside a mentor to learn that occupation. And we're combining it with a related training and a related technical education. Generally, that related technical education comes from post-secondary education, our local colleges, um, our university systems. Um, but sometimes we do just have some nationally recognized training programs that we utilize. Um, but we're combining those two, the on-the-job training and the related technical education um, and bringing that low-skilled worker to a fully trained worker. Um, combined with that, so the apprenticeship is the earn why you, or learn why you earn model. Um, so as those individuals are becoming more competent workers and becoming closer to a fully trained worker, there's also wage increases. Um, that is a huge incentive for apprentices um, because I, I've never walked into a job. I've been told that I'll get a, a weight raise, but it's not always written down for you um, that if you complete this training program, your wages will increase. Um, so how does this all work? Um, so the apprenticeship program and the training model, um, it's a three-party approach. It's the business, the apprentice, and the Department of Labor. Um, so that's the, I think I come from private business. So I think that's the best thing about apprenticeship is that we are an industry driven. Um, we, we aren't gonna come into a business and tell them how that they need to train an individual for their job. We, we work with businesses. Um, we, they're a huge part of it um, on how they, they develop their program. We just kind of help formalize it and package it for them. Um, what's in it for a business? Um, so, you know, that is one big thing. Um, what are the advantages for a business to utilize apprenticeship training model? Like I mentioned, it's the employer driven approach um, to workforce development. We're just trying to build a skilled workforce um, and we need industry's input on how to do that. It's customized structured training. So uh, we, that's how we can help um, is structure that training um, organize it a little bit. I mean, business owners are very busy. Sometimes it's hard to kind of lose track. Um, we listen to them. We help build it. It's structured um, and pretty well written down. And it's, it's not always set in stone unless, of course, you're a licensed trade. Um, those, those licensed trades, they have their boards that set that. But um, that ha having just that backing to structure the trading is, is incredibly helpful. Um, it also expands your applicant pool. So it, you may train somebody, um, you may train somebody um, and they'll leave, which happens often, but if other people in your industry are training people, those people are gonna come back and just having a skilled workforce um, increases your applicant pool. Um, it offsets costs due to the wage schedule, the high retention rates. Um, so that, that's always really huge. Um, the high retention rates, I believe it's 83% of um, apprentices in 2013, we're still there nine months later. Um, so that's with, with the average uh, apprentice taking two to four years, um, having them there nine months after completion, that's meaning that they're there three to five years. Um, I feel like, especially in today's um, world, having that retention is really big and, and helpful for, apprentice, or for businesses. Uh, the apprenticeship tax credit. Um, so uh, well, I have another slide that kind of goes through that, um, but uh, there is a tax credit for businesses that participate in the apprenticeship program. Um, what's in it for apprentices? There's the paid on the job training that's structured. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, they come in and they have that wage schedule that's built in. They can, they're sometimes a, low, a no, low or no skilled worker. Um, they can see kind of that light at the end of the tunnel. If they um, complete their program, you know, they're gonna be a journey level worker and their wages are gonna be higher. Uh, the pipeline into the well-paid career fields, 
So that's one thing that's also interesting with us. We do not um, apprentice low, low wage or low skilled. I'm sorry. No, you have to go. Um, we do not apprentice low wage or, um, sorry, kids, <laughs> um, low wage or low skill jobs. Um, we, um, um, so we, the, the jobs that we're going to apprentice are going to be jobs that have higher, have sustainable wages. Um, and then also they're, they're going to be good jobs, career jobs. We, we really like to see the career ladders. Um, we also receive a nationally recognized credential at the end of your uh, apprenticeship program. That nationally re recognized credential for any business or industry that participates in the apprentice in apprenticeship, they are going to know what that means. It's, it's really more than a piece of paper. It means that you are, you have completed on the job training and post-secondary education. Um, you are a journey level worker. It, um, and then there's also the veteran education benefits that are approved for apprenticeship. So if a veteran um, wants once they come back and they choose to enter into an apprenticeship program, they are eligible for their GI benefits. So with apprentices usually starting at 40% of the journey worker wage, um, that can be difficult um, for anybody, especially people that have served in our armed forces to come back and start a job at 12 to $14 an hour. They are eligible for all the benefits of their GI bill, including um, those cost of living. Um, apprenticeship facts. So there's um, currently under 2,000 active apprentices in Montana. Um, and in five years, we increased 30%. And a lot of that was going out in our expansion efforts into other industries. Like I mentioned earlier, just in response to the, the cry for needing skilled workers. Um, 21 of those occupations are actually in healthcare, um, which is big. Healthcare has been our huge um, driver of um, our expansion and our, our success in the expansion area. So um, the new apprenticeship fields, one, some of the more interesting ones is a master brewer. So breweries across Montana are really popping up. Um, and that is, it takes a high skill list set and a lot of learning and Definitely, I feel like that mentor relationship um, in order to become a master brewer. Um, so we actually even have a master brewer uh, apprenticeship program, um, computer support specialist, uh, manufacturing technician, a lodging manager. So definitely in our hospitality industry, me being in Bozeman, I see the need um, for hospitality. Um, I think it the apprenticeship training model in there also kind of gives people the incentive to maybe start and on the in those lower wage and lower skilled jobs because there is those opportunities to to maybe work with their way up to management. Um, surgical tech again in the healthcare. Um, so women in apprenticeship. So 18 percent um, women are making up 18 percent, and it was actually only three percent in 2013. Um, so that's big. We're getting more and more women into the apprenticeship training model, um, which I think is great. I, and I think those other, well, it is the reason for that is the uh, new occupations. Um, there hasn't always traditionally been a lot of uh, opportunities outside of just going to college um, for women. And especially sometimes um, women start families or um, going to, and going to traditional college isn't just the, the something that works for their family. So that's, that's another like benefit to the apprenticeship training model. Um, is that earn while you learn, or learn while you earn, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Oh, and this is another thing I should mention, that tax credit that I mentioned or, earlier. So in 2017, 440 apprentices were potentially eligible for the tax credit. Um, that any, I think any sort of tax credit for business is beneficial, especially, you know, combining it with any of the, all those other incentives and the pros for the businesses. This is just kind of going through the occupations. And so that apprenticeship tax credit um, is actually, it's $750 for an apprentice. Um, and then that, that tax credit actually doubles for um, an, if an apprentice is a veteran. So that's also 
great benefit for business. Um, and then just some current occupations. Um, so finance, accounting techs, that's pretty, pretty big. We were kind of dabbling in the travel agency area um, and that was kind of fun, um, but I think COVID's definitely putting a little bit of a halt to that. In agriculture, so the organic farmer, um, and then actually our butcher and our meat cutter, that was the butcher and the meat cutter, the apprenticeship program I feel like is kind of on a part of such a, a new turnover. So that meat cutter was is such a dying trade. And I think people are definitely starting to recognize the importance of shopping local and getting, you know, sourcing your food locally. Um, and so it's really coming back, which is super exciting um, just to bring the occupation back, especially when technology has taken over so many occupations to see some occupations coming back is nice. Um, so auto, um, again, just having that mentor relationship is awesome in the auto industry. Uh, the building trades, obviously we're huge in the building trades. Um, our most common programs are our our um, electricians and our plumbers, and that's because their licensing requirements require it. So we also just have like some craftsmanship, which is really cool. Again, some of these dying industries that we still have a need for, um, but we, it, how do you become a locksmith or a saddle maker or a boot maker? Um, you got to work with a mentor and learn that trade. Um, so apprenticeship has been a big, has been a part of those, and those are kind of fun and exciting to see those. Computer and IT, um, electrical, like I mentioned, we mentioned the healthcare. Um, railroad, so railroad has always been a, a union sponsor um, and they have always utilized the apprenticeship program. One thing that was, is also kind of awesome about the apprenticeship program, so we the railroad has suffered a little bit um, just to um, the economy and just new, new ways of doing things, I guess. And so we were actually able to take some of those apprentices because they had completed apprenticeship programs and bring them into other apprenticeship occupations, giving them credit for the skills that they've already learned. So I know I mentioned that some of our, um, we're taking low wage or low skilled workers and bringing them up to, to journey level workers. Well, laid off railroad workers are not low skilled workers. These are people who are very skilled. So that, that was kind of, that. That's something I worked on um, this spring and that was kind of exciting and good to see that we can take that apprenticeship because it is structured and we know that these people are skilled and be able to transition those skills that they've learned into a new new occupation or and usually those there were similar industries um, and they can get credit for the work that they've already completed and the skills that they've already gained. Um, so Montana registered apprenticeship, what's our role? Um, so being under the Department of Labor, obviously just um, protecting the workforce um, is one of the biggest thing. Um, we promote apprenticeship in Montana to businesses and job seekers. So like I said, I was just speaking with some middle schoolers, uh, just talking about apprenticeship as you know an option to their career search and when they get into high school and what direction they choose to, he to head. Um, and then also just working with businesses to help get them skilled workforce, a skilled workforce. Um, provide technical assistance to developing new apprenticeship programs. Um, like I said, those are all industry driven, um, but we will help research um, related training instruction. We will help, we will take your, your job outlook and we will break it down into hours for you and we'll, we'll really help um, package that up for you, package that training program up. We register new programs and we support existing sponsors and apprentices. You know, that supporting of existing sponsors and apprentices um, is also a big Thing. I get calls often from apprentices, um, you know, even down to saying my boss is not very nice to me. Um, and so just being able to support them it is, is helpful and, you know, just kind of help see them through their program a little bit saying, yeah, I know maybe it's hard now, maybe some changes, you know, just visiting with them, but then also just reminding them at the end of their program that, you know, our apprentices are completing at around $60,000 just under $60,000 a year on average, um, that if they don't complete this, um, they, that op opportunity won't be there. Um, and then we issue those nationally recognized credentials upon completion, um, just so businesses can vet their skilled workforce. And that is actually all I have. 
Great, we appreciate it, Lindsay. We'll give it a second to see if there's any questions on Pump Bump. I, I do want to mention to everybody, I love apprenticeship. I think it's awesome. I love helping out businesses. The, the, the brewery thing was pretty cool. I was able to be not a part of the apprenticeship side, but I was uh, able to be a part of a pro, another program that we have, and it's called the IWT program, the Incumbent Worker Training Program. And it was pretty cool because those two programs, apprenticeship and IWT, were able to come together. They did the, appre the apprenticeship program with a brewer at a local brewery here in Helena. They got them all set up and go through stuff. And then we came in with IWT to help pay for some fundings up to $2,000 if it was for training materials, tests, if it is even wage matching um, so that they're doing during the uh, training activities. So the, the IWT program could always piggyback off of apprenticeship, um, but let alone apprenticeship is awesome. And you guys for sure look into it more if, if that's gonna be a realm for, for your folks to, to get them upskilled. Lindsay, thank yeah, you so- And you know, Tanner, um, also just on the vet too, you know, we have that incumbent worker training, but you know, we also work with all of our partners. Um, and so sometimes even just helping businesses um, skill up those people that maybe have barriers or to becoming skilled up. And it might not even be physical or mental barriers. Sometimes it's just their life barriers. Um, and so there's, we, we try really hard to partner with um, all of with everybody and leverage all available resources to help the business and help the apprentice be successful. Yeah, true. So again, take a look at uh, apprenticeship. I, I think that's great. Lindsay, thank you so much. Uh, Lindsay, again, she is your Bozeman Billings, kind of that whole area down there. She, she has many hats of traveling for many communities. Lindsay, thank you so much. Your wealth of knowledge. I know everybody here appreciates you. And if there is some questions come in, we'll, we'll get them to you. I don't see any as of now, but thanks again yeah. for helping out. The ABC and I apologize team. for my son coming in. I Reminded them this morning and I put a note on the door, but yeah, they still have, kind of threw me off there. Like, oh, yeah, my kids, they working from home. Out. I'm like, I have a note on the door that says, don't come in unless you're bleeding. <laughs> my kids do that all the time, so no worries. It's fine. Well, thanks again. And, and, uh, that's going to wrap it up for everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the participation with the ABC Clinic. There is going to be a survey. Casey Keller West will probably send that out. If it's not tied to Zoom, she'll send it out uh, in a different email, but please fill out that survey. Again, this is our first time doing the, the, the virtual ABC clinic. We weren't able to meet in person all year. Usually we start these in the springtime and travel throughout the state and end right around November time for the ABC clinic. So. Uh, we've had a handful of virtual ones tied to Safety Fest. We're sorry we couldn't make it out to your community. I know it's great to be in the community. It's easier to be in person sometimes. Um, but we, we, yeah, so we apologize on that. But anyhow, this is the best that we could have do, could do this year versus canceling all of them. I hope you enjoyed it. We appreciate your participation and thank you so much. If there's any last questions, feel free to put them in. Um, I'll be on for another couple minutes. Thanks, Tanner, for everything. Oh, yeah, you betcha, Holly. Thank you for participating and and then sitting in on all of the, the meetings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd have to be sitting wherever we were having it anyway, so this was a good thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully it, uh, you know, this this is something that people enjoy. I, I think it's it's two hours a day that, versus all-day event. I, who, who knows? We'll see from the, the, the surveys. People do mention it. People do like us in their communities when we, we, we do travel. So we'll see what happens. Again, it's yeah. not up to me. I'm just the relayer. So <laughs> understand. But yeah, I did enjoy the two day. It made it easier to keep up with work at the same time. So I yeah. will definitely fill out my survey. <laughs>
Well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you for for allowing your your staff to participate. They did an awesome job. Um, you got you got a Bozeman has great people down there, and it's awesome that they they could help out. You guys got a good community, so that's cool. Yeah, I, I'm very proud of what they do. So, yeah, we're good. Well, you have a wonderful weekend and holiday. If I don't see you. Great. I appreciate. It. Thanks, Holly. You as well. Thanks. We had a question come in, will you be sending credit codes or do we stay on for that? No, we will be tracking all um, credits and I'll be getting those sent out in the next week or so. What it is, is that we will get reports on people logged in and emails and then we'll get the certificates with the, the numbers on there and then we'll email them to the participants. So that question about the codes, no, we don't have them as of right now we'll get the certificates mailed out with the codes on there for you. Right, thanks again, everyone. Stay safe out there.